All right, so this is going to be the second video in what is now, I guess, a series of videos about why the right fails politically speaking. And like the first video, this video is not going to be very data oriented and it's going to be a bit ranty, but hopefully it will still have some value. This video is going to be about granting enemies, granting enemies legitimacy. And I'm going to focus on three specific contexts, the context of the media, education, and the government. Beginning with media, because this is the one in which I think the conservatives have done the least uh, poorly in. So today, liberals complain about the fact that there's a growing faction of Republicans who won't engage with mainstream media. They'll call it fake news and the like. But if you think back you know, 20 years ago, if you tried to show a liberal an article, say from Fox News, they would go, oh, that's Fox News, and they wouldn't consider it. They would not see it as a legitimate source of news. Now, the Republicans in media, in Fox News and in talk radio, and it's worth saying that Republicans have a lot of control over media. They talk a lot about how they're not part of the mainstream media. There is a sense in which that is true. Most journalists are to the left, but conservative journalists and commentators in talk radio and Fox News get way more viewers on average than do uh, media on the left. So that depending on the year you look at, in some years, in fact, the majority of media, the majority of political media consumption is uh, for conservatives. And they complain about the media and they call it biased and corrupt and the like. And so in that sense, they do engage in a process of uh, delegitimizing it, but they don't try to instill their viewers with a norm such that they just won't even consider information from CNN or NPR or ABC News or MSNBC, etc., or the New York Times. And again, I think that's changed somewhat in recent years. There's a little bit of that now, but it is still not as pushed on the right as the analogy is on the left, where they just don't consider information from conservative media to be valid. Instead, and there's almost a kind of lack of authenticity in this, conservatives, like I say, will call liberal media liberal and biased and corrupt, but then they will behave in ways and their viewers will behave in ways as if it is a legitimate source of news. Now they might say, well, liberal sources of news do sometimes say true things and so we should consider them. And there are a few things you can say about that. I mean, firstly, obviously liberals know that Fox News sometimes says true things, but the problem is they don't consistently say true things. They're reliably biased. And so they tell people not to consume that media, not to consider it legitimate. Secondly, you have to think about this in terms of the conversion rates of the news. So imagine that we have 100 people and 50 are liberal and 50 are conservative to begin with. And the conservatives, the 50 conservatives, consume conservative media and to a lesser degree, liberal media. And because of their consumption of liberal media, 10% of them over the lifetime are converted. So we lose five conservatives. Now it's 45 to 55, 55 liberals. Liberals, because they don't consume, say, Fox News at all in this example, none of them are converted by the news to anything but their own you know, pre-existing position, doubling down on it or whatever. And so you can see through that dynamic that even if it is true, that if you're just trying to find out the maximal number of true things about the world, you should read both sides. In terms of political strategy, in terms of who's going to win, there's a clear advantage to the group that just fundamentally delegitimizes the other side's news source and not the group that just talks about it being not legitimate, but actually carries through with that in their behavior. And to the degree that we are moving in the direction of delegitimizing the left's media to where conservatives simply just won't look at information from the New York Times or CNN, that is probably politically a good direction to move in for the right, again, in terms of just the probability of them winning. But moving on from the media, let's talk about academia uh, and sort of intellectual life in general, an area where the right has done much worse in, I think, than in the media, and they've not done that well in the media. So academia, again, the right will admit this, is a left-wing institution, very biased, very corrupt. It produces bullshit research that is used to justify a fundamentally evil agenda. Conservatives broadly agree with that. What have the solutions been to this? Well, one has been a horribly failed attempt to just, you know, promote conservative professors uh, that... They don't control the institution, and even when they do control the institution, they practice this kind of uh, liberal tolerance, free speech crap, and as a result, they let leftists get into positions of authority who then do not practice that tolerance with them, and then they get kicked out, and the institution becomes leftist. You know, there's that saying, uh, I don't remember the name of it, but that any institution that is not uh, leftist is going to become leftist with time, unless it is from the outset explicitly defined as conservative, 
you know, I think you could more accurately say any institution that is not already controlled by intolerant ideologues is going to become controlled by intolerant ideologues of time, regardless of uh, the nature of the ideology with respect to which they are intolerant. The other response has been to uh, create think tanks. Think tanks, I think, are a move in a better direction. It's created an alternative institution that is explicitly controlled by conservatives and who are not going to let in leftists, right? Like, uh, the Heritage Foundation is not going to hire people to write their papers that they consider to be leftists who are opposed to the Republican agenda. Now, you might say the Heritage Foundation is not sufficiently right-wing um, or whatever. That, that could be true, but that's a separate, you know, independent concern. So let's just set that to the side for the moment. But there is still this great asymmetry with respect to the fact that the think tanks, firstly, I mean, they mostly produce things that, things that no one reads. And you could say the same thing about academics. They produce, uh, they produce you know, papers that no one reads. But academics have classes. Everyone in the country is forced to just go to academia for years if they want a certain kind of profession. And so think tanks need to make up for that by being massively directly engaged with the public, much more so than they are. And they need to engage in the public by both at once promoting what they're doing and delegitimizing academia. And we might restrict this to academia with respect to the humanities and social sciences. I'm fine if that, you could argue against that, but I don't think it's important for this video. So let's just say, when I say academia, what I mean is academia with respect to the humanities and social sciences because uh, the social scientists in academia will say things like, well, that was produced by, you know, the Heritage Foundation. That was produced by the Cato Foundation. Uh, that was produced by whatever. It was funded by a conservative group. It's not legitimate. Let's not consider that research. It wasn't published in a peer-reviewed journal, which is just to say it was not published by a journal, or it was not r rather released by the mainstream academic institution. That institution did not grant that document its seal of approval and so we're not going to consider it valid and they teach kids they teach kids in college to quote unquote critically think by evaluating sources with respect to the degree to which they have been uh, granted legitimacy by this single academic authority and so we can see the asymmetry because think tanks don't come back and say this is our work look at this evidence that academics are a joke that these people don't know what they're doing that they're clowns do not trust things that come from them the same way they're telling you not to trust things that come from us. In reality, you should be having that attitude towards things that come from them. And we can repeat all the same arguments that we had about the media. You can say, but sometimes uh, mainstream academics say true things. That's true. But nonetheless, from a perspective of political strategy, it is a losing strategy if one side convinces uh, their people to take information from both sides' institutions and the other does not. And you might say that, in fact, conservative think tanks do critique academia sometimes as an institution. I would say two things. Firstly, they don't make nearly as big of a deal of it as they need to. And secondly, even when they do critique academia, they don't, again, follow through with this behaviorally themselves or in terms of the norms they instill in others. They might say that academia is very biased, but they don't follow through with that by saying, and that's why you should not consider their stuff. And so if I had, you know, a great deal of power over right-wing uh, intellectuals, you know, imagine that I did, one of the things I think would be very good for them to do would be to create organizations that, uh, you know, like I say, massively engage with the public that's easier to do now via the internet, made it a very big deal that uh, they needed to be public intellectuals in this sense, any other kind of intellectual is not valid in a political sense, and, uh, and I should say in this specific way, in this context, uh, they're not valuable otherwise, and to make part of their project crafting arguments and uh, trying to spread norms that just totally delegitimize academia. And we can look at government, and the same kind of thing applies. The government, you think about the, the Supreme Court is a good example of this. The Supreme Court, conservatives admit, they say, look, the Supreme Court is controlled by crazy leftists who come in and lie about what the Constitution says. They make things up, and they legally mandate us to engage in leftist policy. Right, they did. They did this with uh, segregation, abortion, gay marriage. Recently, discriminated against people based on whether they were uh, transgender or gay or whatever. And conservatives will say this: that uh, they'll make up these arguments that you know these are not respectable judges, these rulings are not respectable. But also, we have to respect them, which is on its face just totally absurd. And obviously, if one side allows the other side to just come in 
and make rulings that say that actually they're legally mandated to be leftist, basically. Well, then, of course, the left is going to win, especially when you have conservative, so-called conservative judges that come in that care about the precedent set by those leftist judges. I mean, that's just how could you possibly not see that that's a recipe for losing? And what's the other option? It's to just not respect the rulings or the laws that the left passes or whatever. And you might say, well, oh, that's that's quite serious. That's quite scary. It's only scary if, if the left uh, responds in a violent way to this. Now, the left already does this. The left has things like sanctuary cities, states that just legalize drugs that are illegal federally. The left says, sure, there are laws passed by conservatives, but we don't like those laws. And our governments, once we control a government, it's just literally not going to follow them. We're just not going to. And part of the reason they do this is because they know conservatives uh, treat that as legitimate somehow. At once, conservatives say, well, we have to follow the rulings of these leftist judges, even though we know that they're totally arbitrary and evil. But we're not actually going to force left-wing cities or states to follow the federal law. I, again, this kind of strategy, when you you know look at it in that way, it's just self-evident why this cannot work. And all of these ideas have a common feature, which is they involve escalating things, right? So if the right comes in and says uh, to people who currently are involved in the right, do not take academia seriously, and not just say, you know, oh, they're, they're a joke, but actually follow through with that behaviorally, actually don't accept mainstream, you know, left-wing academic sources, do not accept uh, left-wing news organizations and do not accept the rulings of arbitrary leftist law. If they do that, then the left, it is feared, could respond by, you know, creating even more tension, doubling down on these things, becoming even more extreme themselves in their intolerance. They could also do the opposite. They could also say, oh my gosh, the conservatives aren't just letting us walk all over them anymore. Now we have to play by the rules. That could happen. But it could also go the other way. And if it goes the other way, then, uh, well, I mean, frankly, then it, then it does. I mean, what else are you going to say? Are you going to say, oh, my gosh, well, I cannot fight for my political ideology. The other side just has to win because the other side decided that if I don't let them win, well, then they're going to throw a fit. And they're going to make things hard and they're going to uh, make things risky. I mean, who guaranteed you that your political ideology could win without anything getting hard or risky no one. And this isn't fun, right? Like, it's not like, I mean, I, I wish it was true that you could sort of just respect the other side and the other side would respect you and we could have this classically liberal marketplace of ideas and a free exchange of thoughts and uh, we disagree, but we agree to disagree civilly and respectfully uh, and that's a symmetrical thing. I mean, that would be cool, but that's just not reality. And you strongly enforcing these norms on your side but not having the power to enforce them on the other side, which is only growing more intolerant with time, leads you to a loss. And this obviously mirrors the other thing I talked about in my previous video about why the right fails, which had to do with right-wingers at the individual level and in the masses, because now I'm more talking about right-wing elites, but the masses of right-wing people not being willing to engage in uh, even minor levels of conflict for their political ideology. And how that sets up an incentive structure that leads people to become leftists and for leftists to be intolerant. The exact same thing is true at the level of these elite institutions. Now, it's worth saying uh, that, you know, I am fundamentally pessimistic about a lot of this stuff because I don't think the right is going to do any of the things that it would need to do to increase its chances of uh, victory. So I think, again, we're moving in a good direction with the media, but I don't think we'll move in good enough of a direction fast enough. With academia, I don't think that we're going to move in a good direction, partly just because the right has not actually invested the resources needed to create a plausible alternative to academia. Right? You can't say, oh, we're going to rely on the non-academic social sciences exclusively, partly because there's just not enough there to do that. And so that creates a context in which you kind of have to rely to a degree on academic institutions. And on top of that, they're not even fighting a war to delegitimize them anyway. But if they did, then they would run into this problem. What they would need to do, in theory, would be to invest way more resources in building a more serious set of institutions to replace uh, academia with respect to the social sciences and humanities first, or at least concurrently, with their uh, war on the just root consideration of academia as a legitimate source of, of knowledge about human behavior.
in society. And at the government level, I think honestly it just comes down to people being not willing to sacrifice uh, things for their political ideology. Uh, again, that partly relates to the kind of political ideology the right has even promoted in the first place. But it takes a degree of uh, saying, you know, these things are important and it's worth taking risks to defend them. People aren't willing to do that. And that also partly has to do with just the kind of personality that uh, right-wingers tend to have, especially uh, sort of elite right-wingers. They tend to be the kind of people who uh, do want to avoid serious conflict, who get very excited about ideas of uh, civil society and the like. And liberal norms in the traditional classical sense of them. And unfortunately, those sorts of people do not do well in a situation where they are at war, basically, with the other side, and whether or not they want to be or not, uh, they are. So, so yeah, I think that's another reason why the right loses. We don't delegitimize the left's institutions the way the left uh, first subverted and occupied our previous institutions and then delegitimized all of our attempts to create replacement ones and so given that, uh, yeah, that just decreases the chances uh, of the right being successful. So, there you go.